Um, of course, uh, it's um, a general overview on the design philosophy we use. Of course, to talk about design, we would need uh, a lot of time. Uh, we have a couple of hours, let's say, and in this time we will try to give you some general infor main information on how to design um, an MBR system, okay? Which is uh, uh, the, um, the heart of the uh, conversation today. Uh, in, um, in our presentation this morning, we will uh, follow more or less this um, uh, this schedule. First of all, uh, we will see what are the uh, main <coughs> key design parameters we want to, uh, to know in order to uh, proceed with a good design of a project. Uh, so inlet and outlet data and all the other elements uh, we uh, maybe find interesting to correctly size and design a plant. Then we will move into the process Okay, so uh, together with Simona, uh, we will go uh, inside each different section of uh, uh, the design to see what are the elements and uh, we will also give you some uh, tips or advice, uh, uh, general, uh, to size uh, those uh, sections. Of course, um, the design of a MBR system can be uh, very simple, but also very complicated. It depends on the type of uh, water we are dealing with. Essentially, today we will start from a civil wastewater, okay, which is, let's say, for us very standard. Uh, and from, but, but it's the basic for any type of design. Of course, if we are talking about industrial, we have um, a slide also for industrial, but you will see uh, saying industrial water means a lot of things because industrial is from a very large variety of uh, processes and every uh, process has different characteristics of the water. In some applications we will find more oil and grease, in other applications we will find very high COD values. So it's, it's very complicated in, and in these particular cases we will need uh, to uh, know very well the characteristics of the water for this particular application. <coughs> we will not talk uh, in detail about membranes because Gianpaolo already did a very good presentation, so we will skip that, uh, that part, even if it's included in our uh, whole presenta uh, presentation. Finally, uh, if you are not too tired, uh, we will um, give you some uh, um, again a general overview on a comparison between technologies okay because today we'll focus on MBR and maybe can be interesting to see some advantages compared to other traditional uh, conventional activities large or MBBR systems just to understand what are the, the, the differences can be and then some uh, advice on further readings or tools you can find uh, online or here with us to uh, go deep into these uh, uh, issues. <clears throat> Let's start with uh, the first part, which is the key design parameters, okay? And essentially in this slide we have, let's say, 90% of the elements that we need to uh, design and to size a plant. Um, first of all, we need a flow. It's quite essential if we want to understand what will be the size of our plant. Uh, normally the flow uh, is expressed as cubic meter per day in the case of wastewater. And now we will go into more details. Then we need uh, uh, the number of population that we need to serve, okay? Um, we will talk about uh, person and we, we will also talk about equivalent population. It's not exactly the same. Sometimes it's easier to have one or the other one. 
So we will see what is the difference and what uh, that means exactly. We have factors such as temperature and altitude, okay, that can affect the process and uh, the uh, genetics of uh, the biological process. So they are important as well because we will see that uh, sizing a plant uh, 2,000 meters up in the mountain is not exactly the same as sizing a plant in Mozambique, for example. Uh, and then, of course, uh, we have some uh, uh, parameters uh, related to the water analysis. And the most important one for us, of course, are BOD, uh, nitrogen, TKN, and uh, uh, phosphorus. That's the minimum, okay? Now, um, temperature and altitude are quite easy to explain. There's not much I, I should add. And it's just a matter of uh, uh, understanding the environment in which we are uh, sizing, okay? Um, it's uh, probably already obvious for you that uh, um, cold cloud, sorry? It's touch. Uh, <laughs> if you want, you okay, great. Cold climate have uh, um, uh, a different uh, uh, biological uh, genetics compared to uh, hot climates, right? So uh, that can make the difference uh, when we size with our tools and we try to find out volumes and velocity and other things to understand which is the maximum and minimum temperature we are dealing with. At the same time, also altitude has, uh, um, can affect those calculations as well. Uh, for example, for the oxygen if it, um, transfer efficiency, but also for uh, when we size the motor of the equipment, okay, such as blowers or pumps and so on. So this is quite easy to, to, those are um, uh, data that uh, we can easily, normally we can easily have from uh, the client because uh, normally uh, the final destination of the plant is known, okay? If I go back to this slide and now we will move to these three points, we will see how those three are very related to each other. So they um, they will change and they will affect each other um, quite strongly and sometimes it is possible to uh, calculate one without uh, knowing it from the other two, okay? Because we have some values in literature, especially for the civil wastewater, that will help us a lot. <coughs> Let's start from the equivalent population. Uh, normally, uh, when we, in our experience, when we talk with a client, uh, one of the first thing we can understand is, uh, give me a project for uh, 2,000 uh, small area, or for a, a two uh, 200 man camp, or um, I don't know, the number of people is probably one of the easiest number we can get from the client because we know if it's an hospital, let's say we have 200 beds in the hospital. If it's a camping, we have, I don't know, uh, 3,000 square meters of area for uh, tourists that will uh, be there in the summer. Okay. Um, as I said, Number of people and equivalent population is not exactly the same. Equivalent population technically has a definition which is quite sometimes uh, scary, but essentially, <laughs> uh, and I think it's a little bit old style as well, uh, because uh, uh, probably other than uh, communities where they can tell me it's 2000, equivalent population on 10,000 or 1,000. In uh, most of our application, uh, please consider that we are very 
uh, focus on uh, uh, small and medium sized projects. We do not deal very a lot with um, uh, municipal application where probably the equivalent population is easier uh, to find. In, uh, in the type of application we are dealing with, most of the time we have men or person, okay? But of course they do not exactly uh, are as equivalent population. Because when we are talking about equivalent population, so we are talking <laughs> Sorry. We are talking about uh, um, an organic uh, load of 60 grams of BOD per day. So this is the number related to one equivalent population. Normally we are talking also about a flow which is around 200, but the, the, the correct number is 60 grams. So uh, normally um, let me show you the, the, the next one and then I'll come back. Um, we can have different scenarios, as I said, we have residential, commercial, <coughs> schools, hospitals, uh, camping, uh, petrol station, airport or whatever. There is um, a correspondence between uh, the number of beds, square meters, offices, person, to the equivalent population. Just to give you two very quick examples, in a hospital, one bed stands for four equivalent population, okay? In, uh, when we're talking about um, workers, okay, like, uh, how can I say, uh, yes, yeah, workers, normally three, worker, three workers in a camp uh, are equal to one equivalent population, okay? So there are charts everywhere uh, in uh, uh, literature and they can be found online that normally can show you the correspondence between uh, the equivalent population and the number of person or the number of beds or uh, the, the, the area. So going back to the, um, uh, to the equivalent population, normally uh, when we reach the equivalent population number, we know we have some uh, values, especially in the civil wastewater, we can use for the design. And normally those values are 60 grams uh, of BOD per equivalent population per day, 12 grams for the nitrogen and 2 grams for the phosphorus. So this uh, value uh, will help us in the design uh, phase of our plant. There are ranges, of course. Uh, the one that we have indicated are an average value that we commonly use in civil wastewater. Um, if you remember the first slide, sorry again, we, uh, I told you about uh, uh, the inlet parameters, okay? And uh, BOD, which is related to the 60 grams per person per day, is one of the most important parameter to design. It's essential to design uh, a wastewater treatment plant. BOD normally um, is a data that we can measure, okay, with water analysis. Uh, we can measure that directly, but it normally takes at least five days because it's BOD5, it's measured uh, in an incubator for five days. Or um, a more direct measure can be the COD. Okay, one is the biological oxygen demand and the other one is the chemical oxygen demand. Um, of course, there is a relationship between uh, COD and uh, BOD. And um, um, according to this uh, relationship, 
um, we can also find uh, the best uh, type of treatment we can, uh, uh, we can use or we are dealing with. Because normally if the ratio uh, BOD, COD is, uh, um, if it's uh, more than zero, <laughs> sorry, I'll use this to indicate, yes, that's why. <laughs> Um, if it's more than 0 0.6, it means that the wastewater is biologically treatable. If it's between 0 0.3 and 0 0.6, it means that the wastewater can be treated biological, but bacteria needs acclimatization. Or if it's less than 0 0.3, uh, maybe wastewater must be treated with other methods because it... Sorry, what, what do you mean acclimatization? Um, it's, uh, pardon? Uh, uh, biomass needs to adapt to the wastewater characteristics. Okay. And uh, COD normally is uh, easier to measure, okay? Um, because it's a direct measure, in a couple of hours we can have uh, an immediate uh, value. And so sometimes, um, um, especially in camps uh, or things like that, is one of the uh, most available measure we can have. But BOD, of course, for us is always the best thing and is one of the data we have to insert in our uh, calculation sheet to reach uh, uh, all the numbers for the volumes, uh, volumes and all the other uh, flow rates uh, for recirculation, for the air and so on that we need. Um, the, flow, the flow is one, uh, another important issue and when we're talking about the flow, uh, we, we can talk about uh, the um, per capita flow, so what is the uh, flow that every equivalent population or every person has and that is normally a data that can vary significantly according to the application because uh, sometimes if we are in uh, for example we are designing for a resort the quantity of water that we are uh, using per each person is normally high three, even 350 liters per day because in a resort there is a lot of water consumption, long shower, people are relaxing, uh, swimming pool and everything and anything. If we are in a, I don't know, working camp uh, in, uh, in Africa, for example, maybe the water consumption is significantly reduced. Maybe it's 100. I've been dealing also with 80. And of course, it's easy to understand that uh, the volume of water is very uh, related to the concentration that we will then find in the water. Because if we're starting from the point that one equivalent population has 60 grams of BOD, okay, it's not the same if those 60 grams are in 350 liters or in 80 liters, right? Concentration, there is one is hydraulical and the other one is biological. Okay, so what we will uh, uh, deal with every time is an hydraulical part. Okay, let's say I, I have 100 men and I have 200 liters per man. So it's very simple, 100 multiplied by 200 and I have the hydraulical flow, right? Which is 2000 cubic meter per day. But this is not enough because I need to understand what is the concentration I have now. I, ha I need to take care of the, biolo the, the biology of the system, right? So, um, sorry, I don't want this slide, no. Yes, um, what I have to, to, to find out again is what, are, what is the, my, my concentration of BOD, nitrogen and phosphorus at the beginning and what is then what I will get outside at the end. Those uh, numbers here refers to um, average typical composition of municipal 
uh, raw water, so again, civil uh, application. And uh, normally, we can think of having a BOD at the inlet of our plant, which is around 350 uh, milligrams per liter as an average value. This is from literature, okay? So we're not talking about water analysis right now. We are talking about a water that we don't know, we don't have water analysis, and sometimes we have to make assumption, okay? So in civil wastewater, it's quite easy to make assumption, and we know that BOD is, BOD is around uh, 350, uh, nitrogen is around 60 or phosphorus is around 15 at the inlet because those are quite common for CV. Yes, globally on average, yeah? Average, of course. So America, but, Africa, England, it doesn't matter where. Yes, civil, it's the same. But, of course, um, to be as much as accurate as possible, the best thing is always to have water analysis, okay? Yeah, especially if we are on a project size, uh, we can still make assumption. But when we have to build a plant, so we, we actually have to produce it and then make sure it's working properly, water analysis are essential at the inlet, okay? And uh, we have some forms, we can even share with this form uh, with you because it was one of the questions you raised before. Um, and we call them data request form. So um, it's a um, two page uh, of question, let's say, sure, that uh, if you go to the client, uh, you should fill and then come back to me and say, this is my water, this is my application. There, is, uh, there are data such as the final destination, of course, uh, which will help me with altitude and um, temperature and then there is a list of desired analysis and um, the most analysis I have the most accurate design I will give you back because I will be able to, to balance and to calculate exactly how is phosphorus, how is nitrogen and how is BOD and COD dealing with uh, my system. Um, if you remember the first slide, I said that 90% of the information are here, right? Uh, how many people, what is the flow, uh, and what are the concentration at the inlet? Well, the 10% that is missing is the outlet now, because um, it depends on what you want to do with this water, right? What are the limits you have to respect and then we move to uh, this slide um, sometimes i want to discharge in the river sometimes i want to reuse the water okay two very different sometimes i want to go sub irrigation in the soil it's uh, we have different scenarios right and we also have different regulation in every country the limits may be different, right? In Italy, we have a certain uh, law. To tell you the truth, even regions in Italy have different limits and probably is like that everywhere in the world. According to the outlet that you want to reach, well, that is one of the other parameters important for me to, under to choose, first of all, the technology, okay? and uh, to make sure that uh, the outlet value will be uh, sufficient for the final use of the water that you want to have. For example, if I'm discharging in the sewage or in a river, maybe even a conventional activated sludge treatment can be enough. Uh, if I want to reuse, then probably I will move for sure on MBR system because I, we will see later when we do the comparison, uh, the efficiency is higher and the quality at the outlet is higher. But at the same time, if you don't care about reusing the water, 
you don't care, not even care about the, uh, how big is your plant, so you don't need a compact solution, well then go for the uh, normal activated sludge, which can be cheaper uh, and maybe easy to, easier to manage than other system, okay? So it's always a matter of putting on your uh, balance what are the, um, the costs and uh, um, the actual uh, need that you have to satisfy for you or for your client, okay? I think it's, the next one is your slide. Ah, oh, no, sorry. Here I just put some slide on uh, some uh, uh, regulation we have for the wastewater. This is the um, uh, council directive uh, showing you the um, BOD, COD, uh, total suspended solid. Uh, this is for uh, um, uh, the, the outlet parameters. We have it also uh, for the specific Italian uh, legislation. We okay. will be in the ECI tomorrow. I know, I know. So we will throw those, we will throw those away. No. But do you have new regulation then? Ready? All right? Okay, okay. Regulation for us. <laughs> and uh, different uh, discharge, we have table four, table five, according to the final uh, destination, right? It's uh, um, in the soil, in the river, and so on. So, and this is typical of every, uh, country. So when we, we are designing for an African country or an American country or an Australian, we need to know the local regulation because they can make the difference. Okay. And <coughs> here you have some photos showing you some application um, uh, with MBR systems. Essentially, uh, we can deal with three different type of uh, design, right? The um, conventional activated sludge uh, process, the MBBR, moving bed bioreactors. I don't know if you are familiar with that. Um, it consists of, um, it's like having a conventional activated sludge, but inside uh, the nitrification and oxidation tank, or just oxidation, it depends. We can put some, um, um, how can I call them, carrier, okay? Uh, in, they are like plastic uh, bowls, uh, it, they have different sizes, and uh, in, uh, around which uh, the sludge and bacteria grows. So they enhance the, um, the, they reduce the volume, of course, of the tanks, and they enhance the process, okay? Maybe it's another way of designing, but it's another possible technology that stays a little bit in between the conventional and the MBR. It doesn't have the same efficiency as the MBR, but at the same time reduces some, uh, for sure, the volumes and also the, the efficiency of the process. And then the MBR, which is uh, <coughs> the, um, the object of the, the training of today. Uh, and in this chart, we can have a comparison between these three technologies. Uh, the first parameter we want to check is, of course, the effluent quality, which is one of our most important uh, factor. Um, normally, um, of course, the, efflu the effluent quality increases in this direction, it's clear, right? Um, again, it's a matter of what should I do with the outlet water. I want to reuse it, I just want to discharge it, so uh, the choice uh, can be done according to this final um, and uh, use of the water. Um, the conventional can reach the limit, not for the reuse, of course, but for the discharge sometimes is good enough. MBBR uh, can improve these limits, especially if we have a tertiary filtration at the end of this, the, the process. 
and of course the best quality uh, can be reached uh, with the MBR because of course we have an ultra filtration at the end of it and uh, is a perfect uh, system when we have to reuse the water. Uh, another parameter is related to the pretreatments again because uh, normally in the conventional activated sludge uh, we can have bar <coughs> cream or degreaser or maybe sand uh, removal in uh, the big plants. In the MBBR and MBR system is very important to have the fine screening. So the roto strainer or the, uh, the drum filter. Uh, so fine screening is mandatory. Could you uh, centrifuge it? Pardon? Could you, could you centrifuge on the pre-treatment? Or oh, cyclone, yeah, for example. Uh, clarify it. For, uh, for, for the, the MBR? No, for the pre-treatment. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Yeah. But uh, in the case of MBR, still the fine screening is uh, need, mandatory. It's this. not something, uh, it's not an alternative. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> The, the issue regarding the oils at the inlet. Um, when we have a conventional activated sludge system uh, and we have oil uh, going into the system, it's not nice, but still can be managed. Um, when we have oils in the MBBR and especially in MBR, uh, the risk gets higher because the risk is a big cost on the membranes, right? Um, final sedimentation. Uh, in the conventional activated sludge, we need most of the time a big conventional uh, sedimentation tank with a, uh, a proper surface and dimension. <coughs> um, in the MBBR, Again, the sedimentation is necessary. Most of the time is uh, more compact because we, um, we like to use the um, lamella packs in the sedimentation tank to reduce uh, the volumes. With the MBR, we don't need uh, the sedimentation tank because uh, we extract the uh, treated water from the membranes and we can avoid the final uh, sedimentation stage, that in some cases is a, uh, a very interesting volume reduction. Um, complexity, of course, uh, like the effluent quality, the, complex the complexity increases uh, with the technologies, that is normal, everywhere is like that. Uh, more instrument or more technology we add, it means that uh, uh, the risk of uh, uh, having problems with that can get higher. But um, how come it's Italian? The reliability, reliability. Um, well, the re reliability gets higher. Yes. Okay, when we get. Uh, to the membrane, um, the reliability is higher. Cost at the same time gets higher. Okay, it's um, quite obvious. Um, membranes have a consistent cost. Even if we have a good reduction of volumes, we, and especially when we have big plants with the concrete tanks and uh, consistent civil works, there can be a, an interesting reduction. Operation and maintenance, um, I partially agree with that, but yes, they increase um, not that much, okay, but they do increase. Um, and the, um, the footprint, the area needed for the plant, of course, decreases because the membrane allows us to have the most compact solution, 
okay? Um, we, we've been doing in the past uh, years a lot of uh, compact and mobile solution. We, we are specialized in compact and mobile solution and that's the reason why we moved to the membrane technology because with membranes we had the chance of uh, increasing of course the quality of uh, the effluent but at the same time to work in uh, small volumes. Most of the times we are talking about containers, right? And uh, uh, membranes are a very uh, perfect solution in this type of uh, compact a, a plant. Size container. What size container? Oh, from 20 foot container up to 40. And then the nice thing is that uh, those systems are completely modular, so we can increase the the capacity. And uh, um, for example, I'm right now building a plant in Mozambique, which is 500 cubic meter per day. Okay and uh, is made of five containers. Okay, so we have uh, the first container, which is the dinitrification container, then we have two containers of oxidation, and then we, are, we have 40 foot container, and uh, one container which is completely membrane container. We have 11 membranes inside, and then a 20 foot container which works as a local room with all the blowers, uh, sludge pump and so on. But it's a very interesting and compact solution, uh, plug and play because everything is built here and then sent to Mozambique and they just have to connect uh, the external pipe. So it makes the, can make the difference when uh, uh, you're building a camp, for example. Um, this is just um, um, a view uh, showing you the difference between uh, the footprint needed uh, for um, a new, uh, an old conventional activated sludge system, which is the black uh, footprint, against the uh, new MBR system. So you can see uh, how much more compact uh, the MBR solution can be. And it's also interesting when uh, you need to, uh, maybe you have a conventional, it, it happens uh, in Italy quite often now in the municipalities uh, that are built and designed as conventional activated sludge system and they want to um, enhance or upgrade the system because they need to increase the, um, the flow or the quality effluent right now. And they are adding at the end of the system uh, membranes. So membrane is a technology that allows this upgrading even on existing plants. So it's quite, uh, uh, it's becoming popular right now here. Um, energy, energy. Uh, of course, the MBR system, uh, you will uh, probably uh, have understood that from the previous slide, requires uh, more en a little bit more energy compared to the conventional. Just think of uh, the aeration of the membranes, for example. It's like uh, a double quantity of air that you are adding to a conventional uh, system. <coughs> and uh, it's, we're not talking about, it's something continuous, right? Uh, 24 hours a day. And this uh, diagram show you a little bit the, the, the energy consumption uh, difference between uh, uh, conventional and MBR. It's, it's, it's 20 percent. 20, 20, 30 percent. Yes, 20 percent, yes, 20, 25. Right now, there, is, there are a lot of devices to um, improve the efficiency, even motors of pumps and uh, items are now with uh, a better efficiency compared to the, the old. Uh, so maybe this 20, 25% can be reduced a little bit more if you pay attention on uh, what you are choosing uh, as equipment of your plant, uh, 
uh, because there are motors with high efficiency right now, all the motors producers, I'm thinking about Grundfos or air blower producers, they are paying attention to this issue because... Uh, we primarily use Grundfos. Yeah, yes. Yeah, okay. So... Um, we've also experimented with solar. Yes, I was saying that. Yes, the, those, we had some application uh, for MBR system. Um, 100, and, uh, 100 cubic meter per day and also a small one that was 20, 20, 20 cubic meter per day, mm -hmm. so a very compact 20 foot container and four 20 foot container. When was the last time you went to the UK? UK? Uh, yeah. The sun doesn't shine. Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> wind farm, wind turbine. Wind, plenty of wind turbine. But there are some. <laughs> yeah, there are some interesting solar application on these, uh, I mean, non 24 hours a day or something like that because it's not uh, cost effective, of course. But um, hybrid solution uh, that will help, uh, help you dur during the day to save a lot of energy. In, uh, well, uh, that's it. And. Um, this last slide is a little bit uh, more, it's not a comparison between technology, uh, it's a comparison between two design philosophy, because we are talking about containerized, what we like to call compact, and built in place, so the um, large uh, plants, uh, normally concrete with concrete uh, or civil works. Uh, and as uh, I said before, uh, we're very focused on uh, this compact uh, solution. We believe they can be an interesting solution for our um, clients because uh, they're fast and they can save a lot of uh, money in terms of installation in the field. And here we have some uh, uh, interesting difference, of course, uh, um, transportability. All the containerized plants are easily to be transported everywhere because they are essentially marine container that can be shipped everywhere. Yes, for um, transport and a building place plant cannot be transported. You just have to, to, to bring slowly all the materials that you need on site and then start building. Uh, mobility, um, if, you, if you need to move the plant itself because maybe you're working in a camp and after six months or 12 months you move to the next one. So it's a very quick uh, this, a solution that can be dismantled and reused in other uh, areas. Uh, and on the, others, on the other hand, uh, uh, a built-in place plant will stay there forever. Uh, <clears throat> well, the um, containerized solution are relatively light for this reason because they, with a crane or a forklift or whatever, they can be moved. Installation makes a great, a great difference. Uh, the containerized solution are <clears throat> pre-assembled in the factory and um, everything is ready uh, before shipping. So when you go on site, you just have to connect. Oh, exactly. Um, uh, and so the installation time is uh, consistently reduced, okay? And uh, uh, civil works, um, the built-in place uh, plant have a huge uh, effort in civil works. For the containerized, most of the time, uh, a concrete platform is more than enough just to make sure that the, the container is perfectly leveled, and that's it. Even the testing is interesting because, as I said, the plants are completely pre-assembled in the factory. It means they are also tested. How do we test? We do test, we do test them electrically, so we, do, we try all the logic. Yeah. 
okay? Before, we do not, uh, for the waste, we, we build also potable water. Potable water, we can test them with water as well. Yeah. Uh, for the waste, we do not, because other than is a, a huge volume most of the time of water, and we cannot uh, test uh, the efficiency because it takes time for the bacteria to grow, so we are talking about an hydraulic test in that case. But um, we don't even want to um, make the membranes wet before the shipment. So it's um, an electric test it's, uh, and we try all the logic and to make sure that everything is already aligned and uh, properly working according to the uh, functional. Dropping, if you had a container, dropping the container in on site to it being in production, how um, would that take? It? Well, it depends on the size. If we're talking about one container, no, one container, one container it, it will take probably not even a couple of days to be able to fill it with water. Yeah. And then it's the normal yeah. biological uh, way. We, we need to, to be completely um, on a full, uh, let's say, mode. We need to wait for uh, the growth of the <coughs> bacteria. Uh, it depends if we have activated sludge that we can add or uh, bacteria that we can put in. It's very fast. work that goes into controlling the site to put something in. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd say it's good at double play. Yeah. Double play. And oh, then yeah. again, even testing, like when you build in a, a plant, you need to build it, mm -hmm. and then you need time to test it, because it's the first time that you have it in your hands, right? What process so, system do you run? What PLC do you run on your system? Well, depends. Is, is it don't the uh, we the use base Siemens base? or we use Asen. Alan Bradley? Asen. Pardon? Alan Bradley? Yes, could be. Yes. When you, when you come to with these containers, when you need to refurbish them, when you need to redo the membranes, do you pull the plant out? Do you have a lid on the top? Do you crane out? Or? Yes, we do have special openings for everything for the extraordinary maintenance, it means for pumps, it means for membranes, and uh, in some cases we don't even have to extract membranes. We can work in the tank, we, of course we need to uh, empty the tank to, to do that, but we have some application uh, in which the client especially didn't want to extract the whole membrane, so we are just working on the cassette, right, that uh, Gianpaolo showed you before, that can be extracted from uh, the frame and just changed one cassette will weigh 20 kilograms, I think. So just one person can uh, dismantle the cassette and uh, replace the cassette if you don't have, because sometimes in some remote location they don't even have a crane or a, a forklift. I'm thinking about military application in um, or uh, working camps in remote areas, so we pay a lot of attention on that because uh, um, openings and uh, making sure that uh, extraordinary maintenance is possible uh, without any extra... There was a system that you put on a skid that was fully extractable and there was a client that um, in Haiti it was installed in its own, they built a, a building for two or three of these systems. Mm -hmm. Right, so they were like naked systems without the container, but container the size, um, and they just extracted them and put them in a, in a cupboard. Right. Yeah, you yeah. can do a lot of things playing with containers, and um, and the good thing is that everything is in there, pre-assembled, pre-tested, fits in a container, so you can ship it everywhere, and it's a plug-and-play solution, mm -hmm. very fast. Hey, Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. And uh, well, the footprint is a, a huge difference because containerized and compact is the name of them. Mm. They, they are compact, so they will for sure uh, need a smaller area 
and that can make the difference again in some location where you don't have enough space uh, to make uh, uh, on-site uh, works. And uh, <clears throat> even the integration with existing plant can be interesting. I said before, for example, we can add a container of membranes just close to an existing plant and making sure we, it's like a tertiary treatment that we do. And so it's an upgrading with a compact solution right be close to the plant, which is interesting. So uh, it's an interesting uh, solution that uh, we can uh, uh, suggest to our clients and very interesting. That's it.